Hello, and welcome to the Hashtag Able to Save webinar series. Uh, this is our final webinar. It's been uh, the final webinar in a series of five different webinars that we've held over the last month during our Hashtag Able to Save uh, national uh, campaign. Today's webinar is titled Choosing the Right ABLE Program for You. Uh, I'm Chris Rodriguez, Director of the ABLE National Resource Center. Um, and we are just about ready to get started. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the ABLE National Resource Center and is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. In terms of some technical things that I want to go over briefly, um, it's important to note that the audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. Uh, you can control the audio broadca broadcast via the audio broadcast panel. If you accidentally close the panel, you can reopen by going to the communicate menu at the top of the screen and choosing join audio broadcast. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or simply would prefer to listen by phone, the dial-in information is on the right-hand side of the screen. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar. The captions can be found in Media Viewer Panel, which appears in the lower right-hand corner of the webinar platform. If you want to make the Media Viewer Panel larger, you can minimize other panels, such as the Chat Panel, the Q&A Panel, and or the Participants Panel. Uh, in terms of submitting questions, please use the Q&A box to submit any questions you have during the webinar, and we will direct the questions accordingly during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you are listening by phone and not logged into the webinar, you may also ask questions by emailing questions to k-a-u-c-h-e-n-b-a-c-h at ndi-inc.org. Also, this webinar is being recorded and the materials will be placed on the ABLE National Resource Center website. During the webinar, if you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat box to send a message to the host, NDI admin, or you may also email k-a-u-c-h-e-n-b-a-c-h -E at ndi-inc.org. Okay, so just very quick, quickly, I want to introduce uh, our presenter, which is myself, Chris Rodriguez. I am the director of the ABLE National Resource Center. We're also privileged today to have a couple excellent guest panelists, consisting of Martha Savory, who is the director of public affairs and communications for MIFA, and John Nadworthy, who is a parent of an ABLE account owner. Today's agenda includes a little information about the ABLE National Resource Center, some information concerning the hashtag ABLE to Save campaign. We're going to talk a little bit about our ABLE basics, and then we're going to go into the bulk of our presentation, which is going to consist of accessing your disability-related needs, assessing your disability-related needs, identifying and communicating with potential contributors, and examining and comparing available programs based on your needs. At the end of that, We'll be uh, directing some questions uh, to our guest panelists, and then hopefully we'll have some time to answer some questions provided through some of our audience and participants. Okay, the ABLE National Resource Center. The ANRC is a collaborative whose supporters share the goal of accelerating the design and availability of ABLE accounts for the benefit of individuals with disabilities and their families. We bring together the investment, support, and resources of the country's largest and most influential national disability organizations. We encourage you to learn more about the ABLE National Resource Center by visiting our website at www.ablenrc.org. Hashtag Able to Save campaign. So our hashtag Able to Save campaign is a month-long marketing and informational campaign that's been taking place throughout this month of August. The national campaign is spearheaded by the ABLE National Resource Center in collaboration with the center's over 25 national disability 
organizational members, state ABLE programs, financial institutions, and other ABLE-related stakeholders. Hashtag able to save will strive or is striving to blanket the country with widespread information concerning all things related to ABLE with the aim to significantly accelerate the opening of ABLE accounts by eligible individuals with disabilities and their families. Again, the primary goal of this campaign is to increase awareness and education about ABLE accounts and again to accelerate the opening of these accounts nationwide both in the short and long term so that people with disabilities can come to benefit from this transformative new policy that's available for folks with disabilities. Lastly, uh, the hashtag Able uh, to Save campaign again is taking place or has taken place throughout the month of August. We've been very happy uh, with all the information and all the participants that have been involved with getting the information out. We broke the campaign down into five individual weeks of education, information, and marketing. Each week focused on a different aspect of ABLE, uh, again with the aim to provide potential ABLE account owners and their families with comprehensive education and motivation so that they feel comfortable enrolling in an ABLE program of their choice. And you can see there on the screen uh, how we broke the weeks down and the different topics in each individual week. And uh, if you happen to miss one of those weeks or a webinar, some of the materials, don't worry. We have placed uh, recordings of the webinars uh, over those specific topics and uh, the other materials that were uh, distributed during those weeks on our website. So again, I encourage folks to go to the website at www.ablenrc.org. Okay, so before we dive into the bulk of our presentation, which is really helping people uh, understand how to enroll in an ABLE program and helping folks understand what things they might need to take in consideration when choosing the right ABLE program for them, I want to make sure that we all have a basic understanding of ABLE programs and the ABLE Act. So what is ABLE? ABLE is the Stephen Beck Jr. Achieving a Better Life Experience Act, or as we call it, the ABLE Act. And what it does is it amended the federal tax code to add what's called Section 529A uh, into law. And what Section 529A, or the ABLE Act, does is it creates a new option for eligible people with disabilities to save money in a tax-exempt account that can be used for qualified disability related expenses. And the funds in this account are that are placed or contributed into an ABLE account are not, taking in, not taken into consideration when determining that beneficiary's eligibility for federally funded means tested benefits such as Medicaid and supplemental security income. So let's talk about very quickly some basic characteristics uh, that will be consistent across all ABLE programs. So the things that we're about to go over right now in this particular slides, slide, uh, these are things that uh, will remain true no matter if you're enrolled in the uh, Massachusetts plan or the Ohio plan or the uh, Oregon plan. These are things that are found in the federal law that will be consistent across all programs. So to start. It's important to note that there are eligibility requirements related to opening an ABLE account that speak to the age in which the individual first experienced his or her disability and related to the severity of that particular disability. Uh, to learn more about that, again, please go to the website. Uh, in fact, our second week of this campaign was dedicated to just helping people understand uh, what those eligibility requirements look like and the specifics of them. We have an entire webinar that's uh, that's up on the website and I encourage folks to check that out if they want to know more about those specifics. Additionally, an eligible individual is not obligated to enroll in their state of residence. So this is a big deal. This means that regardless of whether or not the state in which you live has launched an ABLE program, you can still, provided that you meet the eligibility requirements, open an ABLE account but you may have to do it through another state's program. So there are currently, I believe, uh, just under 30 states that have launched ABLE programs, and the vast majority of those states are actually enrolling people nationwide. So that means regardless of if you actually are a resident of their state or not. And again, you can learn more about which states have opened up ABLE programs and whether or not they're open to national enrollment 
through the ABLE National Resource Center website. Uh, next, uh, it's important to understand that the designated beneficiary is the account owner. So this means that the person with a disability, they are the designated beneficiary and they are also the account owner. That's very important to note because we wanted to make sure that this new policy or this new law uh, opportunity provides the person with a disability as much independence over their finances as possible. That being said, if the individual has been determined not to have the capacity to oversee their account or if they just choose to uh, want to allow another person to oversee the account on their behalf, there are three types of individuals that can have what's called signature authority or basically be allowed to oversee the account on behalf of the designated beneficiary, the person with a disability. And those are uh, a parent of a minor can have signature authority, a guardian of the designated beneficiary is allowed to have signature authority, or a person that is given power of attorney by the designated beneficiary. All these three types of individuals would be allowed to have what's called signature authority. Uh, next, it's important to uh, note that the funds in the account are to be used for what's called qualified disability related expenses. So this is basically, this means what exactly can the funds contributed into an ABLE account be spent on? The answer is what are called qualified disability related expenses. We did uh, the third week of this campaign, in fact, we did an entire 60 minute webinar on helping folks better understand exactly what a qualified disability related expense is. So I encourage folks again to go back to the website and check that out if you have questions. But what it basically is, it is uh, any expense related to the person's disability that is for their benefit and that helps them maintain or increase their health, independence, or quality of life would be considered a qualified disability related expense and thus the individual would be allowed to use ABLE funds to purchase those things. Next, uh, assets in and distributions for qualified disability related expenses will be disregarded or given special treatment when determining eligibility for most federal means tested benefits including Social Security benefits and Medicaid. So this is an incredible uh, benefit of this particular new opportunity for people with disabilities because uh, many individuals who uh, are provided supports and services through programs such as Medicaid um, are not allowed to have more than uh, in many circumstances $2,000 uh, worth of assets at any given time or else their eligibility for those vital supports and services provided through those programs um, could be vulnerable. So this is a, an incredible opportunity for people with disabilities to save significant amounts of funds for disability related expenses um, that they really for the most part never had before. Uh, additionally, anybody can contribute into a person's ABLE account that includes the, uh, the beneficiary's family, their friends, the beneficiary themselves, so the person with disability who owns the account can also contribute into their own account, perhaps through uh, funds that they've earned through employment or things like that. Um, but despite the fact that anybody can contribute into an ABLE account, you, uh, it's important to understand that all those contributions combined are not allowed to exceed $14,000 in any given tax year. So from January 1 to December 31st, all contributors combined can only deposit $14,000 into the account. Uh, and then come the next year, it starts all over. You can uh, you can um, contribute an additional fourteen up to fourteen thousand dollars in the following tax year, and so on and so forth. And the account can grow. Okay, so um, we've given some information, some very basic uh, and quick information about some of the characteristics that are going to be consistent across all programs, including things related to what the funds can be spent on and who's eligible and some basic uh, components of ABLE programs and ABLE accounts. Uh, so now I want to uh, switch gears and, and really focus on the, the bulk of this presentation, which is going to be information, again, about uh, understanding how to enroll into an ABLE account, and, but maybe more so understanding what are the things that I need to have or what are the things that I should be taking into consideration 
when uh, thinking about opening up an ABLE account? And what are things that I should take into consideration when choosing perhaps one ABLE account over another because it's important to understand that an individual is only allowed to have one ABLE account. So that means that if I open up an ABLE account, uh, let's say in the Massachusetts uh, attainable plan and I open it up there, as long as I have that uh, in existence, I can't then go to another state's ABLE program and open up an additional ABLE uh, account. Um, so s since a person can only have one ABLE account at any given time, it's important to understand which uh, ABLE program uh, best meets your specific needs. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this. So, one of the things when determining, you know, just off the bat, whether or not an individual can benefit from an ABLE account, uh, one of the things you might want to consider doing is first identifying your current disability-related expenses because ultimately the funds, again, in an ABLE account are to be used for disability-related expenses. So, consider making a list of short and longer-term needs or supports that may require financial assistance, right? Uh, consider whether these needs or supports will be covered or financed by other or any public benefit program you currently receive or may receive in the future. Um, because if it's already covered through, let's say, Medicaid, perhaps you wouldn't need to spend um, uh, ABLE dollars on that or if it's provided through some other type of public benefit or support. Also consider other sources of income you may have and how an ABLE account may interact uh, and or complement them. Things like, are you earning income through employment? Are you receiving a cash benefit through SSI or SSDI? Do you happen to have a special needs trust? These are all different uh, programs or different um, things related to your life that may interact with your ABLE account. And you'd want to know before you sign up for an ABLE account how all those things may affect each other. Lastly, consider researching financial institutions and perhaps opening a savings or checking account. This may help with managing your ABLE account, so that's another thing you might want to take into consideration. So some examples, so what, what things might we be thinking of in terms of disability-related expenses or short and long-term needs or supports that could be helped by having funds in an ABLE account. So some examples include long-term supports like personal assistance services, which a government-funded benefit may cover but restrict the number of hours per week or per month. Um, this means, uh, in terms of these kinds of things, it's important to note that an ABLE account can supplement um, benefits already provided perhaps through other um, programs or benefits. Uh, other things include renovations to where you live to be more accessible, perhaps. Uh, things like assistive technology, like hearing aids or repairs to a wheelchair. Uh, the purchase of a computer or an iPad. Uh, supported or customized employment assistance, including on-job training. Uh, public benefits planning. Uh, and perhaps the purchase uh, and, and retrofitting or modifying of a van or things like that. So those are just examples of short uh, and long-term needs or supports that a person with a disability might incur or experience that having funds in an ABLE account could help uh, offset the expenses of those things. Uh, it's also important to investigate costs uh, to meet identified needs and develop a short-term, so short-term we're talking about maybe three years, up to three years, or long-term budget. Uh, having a budget uh, can help uh, guide and motivate your savings in an ABLE account. It really helps you better understand, uh, you know, to what extent you need to be contributing funds or having help uh, maybe family or friends contribute into funds in order to meet the short, or long, short and or long-term needs and supports that you've identified. Okay. So next you might want to uh, look into what's called, what we're calling uh, a circle of contributors. So what does this mean? Again, like we, we discussed previously, anybody can contribute into your ABLE account. Again, this means friends, family, perhaps an employer, uh, certainly the beneficiary themselves can, can uh, put money into that account. So uh, whether it is before you've opened up an ABLE account or perhaps after you've opened up an ABLE account, it's always good 
to cultivate or to develop a circle of potential contributors, folks that uh, are close to you that may, um, for whatever reason, want to help support uh, you in terms of the expenses that you might um, experience as a result of being a person with a disability. Um, also, your contributions to an ABLE account, while uh, they are not tax deductible for the purposes of filing your federal taxes, uh, they may be deductible for purposes of your state income tax, depending on where you live. So we're going to come back to this a little bit later in the presentation, but it is important to note in terms of one of the things that you might want to take into consideration when determining one ABLE account over another is whether or not the ABLE account in your state, if your state has an ABLE account, is providing any type of state income tax deduction or credit for contributions made into your ABLE account. So that's something that might provide an extra benefit in terms of folks contributing into the ABLE account. Um, lastly, while you or your family may not have the resources to contribute $14,000 annually, you might also consider crowdsourcing or letting relatives or friends know about your specific future savings goals and how they can help make it happen. So again, um, people need to understand, I get the question a lot, well, I don't have any money to contribute into my ABLE account, why should I even open one up then? Well, you know, to those folks I would say, uh, you're not the only one, again, that can contribute into these accounts. Perhaps family or friends would like to support you in terms of your uh, future savings goals, uh, again, to help you um, offset some of the expenses that oftentimes come along with uh, living a life as a person with a disability. Um, this includes, uh, I can think, uh, as many of you know who have been on uh, the, the webinars that I've hosted in the past few weeks, I have a brother who has an ABLE account and he lives down in Texas, and uh, oftentimes for his birthday, my grandparents like to contribute funds to him. Now before he had an ABLE account, uh, he was unable to accept uh, those contributions from my, my, my grandparents for his birthday because my parents were, would, are, were worried that he'd lose uh, some of his benefits. Well now he has an ABLE account and come time for his, his birthday, if my grandparents I would like to contribute to him, they can put funds into his ABLE account. So just an example on, on how others uh, can help you uh, build the funds in uh, your ABLE account. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the things you might want to take into consideration before opening an ABLE account and, and trying to kind of set a budget, identify the different needs that you have that could be, uh, that ABLE funds could be used for. Now let's talk just briefly about uh, choosing the right ABLE program. So when choosing the right ABLE program, it's important to understand that your needs are unique and that no two eligible individuals have the same needs for opening, managing, and utilizing an ABLE account. Um, so there's no one size fits all when we're talking about an ABLE program, which is why number one, we are uh, very excited to see so many states having launched ABLE programs, offering so many different opportunities uh, and variations of opportunities for people with disabilities to choose from, um, and why there's no one program that we can point to and say that, you know, this state's program is ultimately the best for every eligible ABLE person, because we understand that each one is a little different combined with the needs uh, that are different per person with a disability. Um, additionally, uh, so there's a lot of things that somebody might want to take into consideration when choosing which program is right for them, and we're going to discuss what some of those look like. But off the bat, uh, we talk about recommending that individuals pay special attention to uh, potential state tax deductions, like we mentioned a little bit ago, or account and asset-based fees, uh, and or programs that feature things like debit cards or maybe an FDIC insured account that's associated with their ABLE account. Some programs offer these, some programs don't. Some people with disabilities would need things like this and some people with disabilities wouldn't. So these are all things you might want to take a look at when looking at individual ABLE programs that you're interested in enrolling in. Also, uh, consider talking with people that you trust. Uh, create a circle of support comprised of family and friends uh, who can help you uh, navigate uh, the various state ABLE programs that might be options to you. 
Um, like I said previously, over half the states in the country have launched programs, so that's uh, you know, just under 30 programs that you might need a little help in terms of comparing them because that's a lot of programs and a lot of uh, different characteristics. Also, uh, while certainly not mandatory, uh, we do encourage you to consider perhaps consulting a financial advisor who has documented experience with creating and or managing funds related to individuals with special needs such as a pooled trust or a special needs trust. Um, so while again it's important to note that um, in order to open an ABLE account you do not need uh, the advice of a financial advisor, however if you have access to one uh, it's certainly not going to hurt getting their, um, getting their advice uh, and insight uh, as to the benefits of an ABLE program and uh, in determining which program might be best for you. Okay, so what types of considerations specifically should, are we recommending that you take into consideration when choosing the right ABLE program for you? So we've broken them down into different sections. So. Uh, to start out, what are some of the considerations that you might want to take into uh, account uh, that relate to the actual opening of the accounts, right? So we've identified the following. You, you'd want to understand how does the enrollment process work for that specific uh, ABLE program. Now you're going to find that the majority, if not all, of these ABLE uh, programs you actually enroll online. So that's something to take into consideration that's fairly consistent across all the programs. Additionally, what proof will the ABLE program require for you to document in order to open up an account or show that your disbursements are qualified expenses? So this is something you might want to ask, and this is another thing that I think is going to be fairly consistent across most programs. Um, additionally, you're going to want to understand, is there a fee to open up an ABLE account? And if so, how much is that fee? Uh, additionally, does that fee differ if you're an in-state resident as opposed to an out-of-state resident? So th it's important to note that there are fees associated with these accounts um, and that they vary from one program to another and they can also vary based on whether you're an in-state resident or out-of-state resident depending on which program or where you live. Also, is there a required minimum contribution to start the account? And if so, what exactly is that amount? So these are all things that relate to the opening of the account that you'd want to take into consideration before jumping in and opening up an account with one program or another. So what things might you want to take in consideration that relate to maintaining or the utilization of the account? Uh, this might include uh, questions like, is there a required minimum contribution to your account? If so, what is that amount? So previously we talked about a minimum contribution just to open the account. But here we're talking about is there a minimum contribution after the account is made. So let's say if uh, you know I want to make um, weekly contributions but I can't afford a whole lot, maybe I can only contribute $10 into an account, an ABLE account uh, a week, um, are, are there minimums saying that I have to contribute at least, let's say, $20? Um, you're going to want to find those things out. And from what I understand, at least the programs that I've seen, they're extremely low in terms of uh, minimum contributions, if at all. But those are things that you're going to see and that are different or may be different from one program to another. Additionally, are there annual maintenance fees? What does that look like? Again, uh, the majority of these uh, ABLE accounts do have some kind of annual maintenance fee. Uh, and they do differ, again, um, based on um, which program you enroll in, and perhaps whether or not it, you're an in-state resident or not. So those are things you're going to want to take a look at. Uh, are there fees front-ended? Uh, are the fees front-end loaded, or are they reduced if you leave your funds invested for several years? These are other questions that you may want to ask. If the fees are, in fact, uh, uh, if the program does have fees. How often are those fees assessed? Is it quarterly? Is it annually? Is it monthly? Things like that. You're going to want to know these answers prior to opening up an ABLE account. And again, these could all be different from one program to another. Uh, additionally, are there restrictions or fees associated with how often you can withdraw funds from your account? 
So this is another thing. You might want to take this in consideration if you know that you're going to be utilizing your ABLE funds for frequent um, expenses. So if there is a fee associated with the number of withdrawals and you are a person who has identified your needs as being pretty frequent, you may want to stray away from those programs and maybe look at programs that don't have fees associated with how often you withdraw the funds, right? Uh, additionally, can you assess, uh, I'm sorry, can you access the funds as soon as the ABLE account is open? Or how quickly can you um, get a hold of those funds um, so that you can purchase whatever uh, disability-related expense that you, you might have? Uh, lastly, and this is a big one, uh, is there a debit card or purchasing card available with that program? And if so, are there any additional costs associated with using that card. So again, this relates uh, back to if you know that if you have identified uh, your disability-related needs as be being pretty frequent, you're going to want to make sure that you have um, very um, quick access to those funds, and a debit card could be something that you're very interested in, as opposed to perhaps you're a parent of a person with a disability and you've opened up the account while they're very young and don't plan to touch the funds until perhaps your son or daughter with a disability is age of majority or 18, uh, then this might not be as big of a deal to you. You might not be as concerned with having um, uh, quick access to the funds or perhaps a debit card. So again, these are all things that you want to take in cons into consideration when choosing the right program uh, for you. Uh, next, investment considerations. So what are some of the things you might want to think about when choosing one ABLE account over another regarding the investments. Because again, and we went over this, uh, I believe, last week, uh, in last week's webinar, um, the funds contributed into an ABLE account are oftentimes placed in investments. Um, and it's important to understand what those investments are uh, and the options that one ABLE program might have from another. So again, what are the investment options in that state's ABLE program? Additionally, are the options likely to meet your needs for limiting risk with the growth of your uh, contributed dollars to the ABLE account? So um, again, as discussed in last week's webinar, um, you're going to have to assess uh, what your risk, um, what type of risk you're comfortable with, and then compare that to the options provided through whatever ABLE program you're interested in. Uh, additionally, does the program offer any unique or value-added program elements to help you save, contribute to your account, grow the account, or manage your invested dollars? Uh, and lastly, what has been the history of the rate of return on some of the investment options provided through one program, perhaps, over another program? Uh, lastly, uh, and we touched on this earlier, but there may be some um, benefits related to opening up an account in your particular state of residence. While it's certainly not required, again, you can open up an account in another state's program so long as you, number one, meet the eligibility requirements to opening up an ABLE account, and two, that that other ABLE program is offering uh, enrollment nationwide. But again, there may be some benefits to opening up in your state. So things you may want to ask are, does your state have a program? Number one, does it even have a program? Uh, and if so, do they offer a state income tax deduction or credit for comp contributions into their account or in, into any 529 or ABLE program? So I want to stop there real quickly and just to make sure everybody's aware, um, nowhere in the federal law does it obligate or mandate that a state establish an ABLE program. It only allows them to do so. So while we have been very fortunate in terms of so many states um, um, electing to open up these and launch these accounts, there are states that will just decide for whatever reason not to open up an account. So if you're interested in these, it's, it's important to understand whether your state is planning on, number one, if your state has launched a program, if it's planning on launching a program or if it's uh, uh, decided to um, not open a program. So those are all things you're going to want to look at. And lastly, does the state program offer any unique value-added programs again, such as a match or rewards program, such as financial literacy training um, that would help the ABLE account owner or their family 
save, contribute to the account, grow the account, and or manage uh, the dollars that are invested. And what does that look like? Okay, so we've gone over uh, a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. Um, again, I would encourage folks to go to the, w, uh, to the ABLE National Resource Center website at www.ablenrc.org to get more specific information. And if you'd like to uh, watch this webinar again, it is being recorded and it will be uh, presented on the website here in the coming weeks. Um, and, and just to give folks, again, an idea uh, or understanding that, um, again, no uh, one individual with a disability or ABLE account owner is going to be identical to another, and there's no one size fits all with respect to the best uh, ABLE program to enroll in. It really is um, a process of understanding your specific needs or the beneficiary's specific needs related to their disability-related expenses. Uh, understanding the different characteristics related to different ABLE programs, and just the level of comfort um, in terms of what the ABLE account owner feels like with respect to opening up their account. Uh, additionally, one more thing before I, I want to bring in our guest panelists. Um, one of the features that we're very proud of on the ABLE National Resource Center is actually an online tool that allows people to compare up to three uh, able programs at a time based on about 12 or 13 different characteristics that we think folks might want to take into consideration when choosing the best um, able program for them. And it goes over things like fees, um, whether or not the program is an in-state program or a national program. Uh, it talks about things related to um, the investment fees and the different financial institutions in, uh, involved in the investment side, uh, and many, many other things. So again, I encourage folks to check out the website and, and if they're interested, um, using that comparison tool to, to help understand the differences from one ABLE program um, over another. So with that, uh, I'm very excited to uh, have our guest panelists with us today. Uh, and I wanted to start out by asking them each a couple different questions to get their perspective, not only on the information that was shared today, um, but um, their experience with uh, ABLE programs. So let's go ahead uh, and start with Martha, who is the Director of uh, Public Affairs and Communications for MIFA. Um, Martha, are you there? I'm here, yes. Excellent, excellent. So let's start out, if you could just tell us a little bit about what MIFA is uh, and how you guys uh, got involved in the ABLE space um, and who you're working with to provide this great opportunity to eligible people with disabilities. Great. Thanks, Chris. I'm happy to do that. MIFA stands for the Massachusetts Educational Finance Authority, and we are what is referred to in Massachusetts as a quasi-public agency. So we are a public instrumentality of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is a long way of saying that we really are here um, to help families all across the Commonwealth. We were started, actually, to help families um, meet the high cost of higher education, and that was 35 years ago. So we've been in Massachusetts helping families for quite a long period of time. And we were able to do that by providing to families a low-cost loan option, um, about 20 Four years ago or so, we actually were able to begin to offer families a college savings program through our prepaid tuition program, which is known as the U-Plan. And soon after that, we were given the statutory designation to offer the 529 plan here in Massachusetts, which is known as the U-Fund. So when it came time to determine um, where the administration of an ABLE program fit best within the Commonwealth, people naturally turned to MIFA because of our experience of operating and running the 529A program, I mean, I'm sorry, the 529 program here in Massachusetts, and we were delighted to be given the statutory designation to provide to families and individuals in Massachusetts that are eligible to participate in the ABLE program um, the opportunity to do that through MIFA. We work and have worked um, in proud partnership with Fidelity Investments, who is the program manager of the Attainable Program or the ABLE Program here in Massachusetts. 
Excellent. That's great. That's great. Well, we certainly appreciate you uh, getting involved in the ABLE space and, and providing this great opportunity to folks with, with disabilities. Let me uh, ask you a couple quick, quick questions. I know that we went over a lot of different characteristics that folks would want to take into consideration when determining one program uh, from another. Uh, in terms of the, uh, of the attainable savings plan that you all are involved with, is that a, a national plan or is that just specifically for residents of the state of Massachusetts? Sure, great question. It is a national plan, which we're excited about. Um, and, you know, we feel as if this is a long overdue opportunity for um, eligible individuals to take advantage of a savings vehicle that's tax advantaged. So we are really excited about the fact that this is able, uh, that, that we're able to provide this um, to anyone in the country that is looking for um, an option like the one that we offer through Attainable. Excellent, great. And, and you had mentioned, and I mentioned it in our presentation uh, in a few of the slides, uh, the fact that these are tax-advantaged uh, accounts, mm -hmm. and I want folks to understand what that means. Um, while, as we went over, the funds in an account uh, that are contributed are not eligible for federal tax deductions or credits, uh, one of the big benefits related to these accounts is the fact that the funds that are invested uh, and as they grow, the growth on the contributions is not taxed, provided that they are spent on qualified disability-related expenses. So that is that is a, a considerable um, a benefit of the funds mm -hmm. being contributed into an ABLE account for a person with a disability. So that, that certainly is a great thing. Um, it we're it come is. Back it's to really important. Oh, yeah. No, go ahead. And, and and you guys, uh, like you said, are paired up with Fidelity, who's the sponsor of our webinar today. And I know that uh, we had a guest speaker representing Fidelity uh, on our first week, uh, about five weeks ago now, giving us some more information about them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it certainly seems like an exciting program. How long have you guys been up and running? We, we launched our program on May 10th of this year, 2017. Excellent, excellent, great. Well, that is wonderful. Um, again, we certainly appreciate you all being involved. I know this is certainly an exciting time um, for people with disabilities with respect to being able to save. As mm. you know, so many people have been um, kind of um, chained or shackled to, to these uh, situations in which they cannot save for their futures because they're so afraid of losing these benefits that provide them with supports and services to remain uh, independent in the community, and this is a great opportunity for people to start learning how to save uh, for their future and really uh, accomplishing a greater sense of financial peace of mind. So thank you guys so much for... Well, and I, I do want to just say, Chris, that, you know, for us as a public authority and a, and a nonprofit, it really, being able to provide this to any individual, whether they're Massachusetts or nationally, um, has really enriched our mission. And, and we as an organization um, are really excited and, and um, just just really excited about this opportunity to work um, with folks all across the country and within our home state of Massachusetts. Great, great. Well, let me uh, turn it over to uh, John now. John Nadwerney is, is with us, and we've worked with John in the past um, to give us a, a little perspective on how things look like uh, in terms of being the parent of an account owner, an ABLE account owner. Um, if you haven't seen it, I encourage folks to go to our ABLE National Resource Center Facebook page uh, where there's actually a profile of John uh, and his son James who has a disability and has recently enrolled in the Massachusetts Attainable Savings Program. Uh, and it's a great example of how these programs and, and the potential of these programs are having beneficial effects on the lives of people with disabilities. But um, John, could you could you give us an idea? Could you actually just tell us a little bit about your son James, um, and and what are some of the considerations that you took uh, into account when uh, opening up um, the account for on behalf of, of of him? So my son James is 26, and he has a Down syndrome. He's nonverbal, and he re um, requires some support. And one of the issues that we had with James is that he is fortunate enough to have a job where he has a job coach and he does have some earnings and the our problem was was that his earnings um, forced him in many cases to really hit that two thousand dollar threshold so 
we're we're really excited the fact is that we have the able account now where we can put money in there when he gets close to two thousand dollar threshold so he does not lose his government eligibility for government benefits and i guess the other second thing is too is that i have two other children and quite frankly it was we always like to have all our children treated equally and fairly and treat and however uh, involved they may be to really encourage them to really trust drive for whatever type of independence they can have and my other two children had bank accounts when they were children and james basically couldn't so i think moving forward this will be another great way of really integrating everyone with a disability and showing that they're not although they may be unique they're not different than others absolutely absolutely well we certainly appreciate you uh sharing your experience and the experience of, of your son uh, James, with respect to, to being able to save funds, um, we touch. I tried to explain just briefly the benefits of having uh, a tax advantage savings account or investment account, such as an ABLE account. Um, but I understand that you work in the uh, financial services realm. So, uh, could you explain just very quickly um, how incredibly beneficial or what it means to be able to have tax-free growth? I think. I think. It's the key term you said was be able to save uh, money for folks. I think in the past there really, truly, really wasn't a tool for individuals to save for themselves while they were um, on, on, on just even a, a, even a non-taxable basis. So I think what I'd like to make a clear distinction too is that it's exciting finally to have a tool that can, people can use for an accumulation vehicle where they can actually save money. In the past, the only tool available was, was, was a special needs trust, and everyone always asked, asked the question, well, what's the difference between the special needs trust and the ABLE account? Well, the big difference is the a special needs trust is really an estate planning tool, and the ABLE account is a wealth accumulation vehicle, two different, two different instruments for two different objectives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great, and I think it's important to note, because I get this question a lot, is um, you know folks saying, well, I have a special needs account. Am I still allowed to open up an able account? And the answer to that is absolutely. You can have both a special needs uh, trust and you can have an able account simultaneously. And in many circumstances, uh, we've thought of plenty of ways that the benefits provided by having both outweigh the benefits of having either one of those individually. Um, so, so like John said, they're, they're really two different entities, and I think in many circumstances um, they can be used in collaboration to really um, help realize even greater benefits than having either one of those alone. Um, let me go to, uh, I know that we're getting a lot of questions into the chat, bo chat box, and I want to address a couple of them. Um, one of the questions uh, is asking, because um, I know we went over the fact that you can only have one ABLE account at any given time, the question was, can you transfer funds from one ABLE account to another ABLE account? And the answer is yes. Um, if you open up an ABLE account in one state and for whatever reason you decide that your needs would be better suited in a different ABLE program, you can make what's called a uh, program to program transfer and you would transfer the entirety of the account from one ABLE program into another ABLE program. Uh, but again, uh, because you can only have one ABLE account at any given time, you would have to transfer all of the funds. You can just transfer half of the funds and then you would have two ABLE accounts. That is uh, specifically um, not allowed. Uh, so you would have to transfer it all, but you can do that um, in the event that you find that your needs change or perhaps um, you wanted to quickly enroll into a program to start saving, but then your state of residence opened up and perhaps they have some extra benefits for in-state residents, you could then transfer into your state. Um, but there may be uh, fees associated with those types of transfers, so that's another characteristic that you might want to find out uh, before enrolling in one program. Um, over another. Uh, let's see here. I have another question. Uh, will the annual contribution limit of $14,000 change on a regular basis or based on cost of living adjustment? So the way that that actually works is it is associated with what's called the um, gift tax exclusion, 
which is um, periodically adjusted for inflation. So when that goes up, that uh, $14,000 cap related to ABLE will go up as well. Um, we don't foresee that happening uh, in the immediate future, but certainly um, if that was to take place, we would do our best to get word out to everybody. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, uh, can I transfer funds from a special needs trust into an ABLE account? The answer is yes, you can. Again, anybody, anything can, can make a contribution into an ABLE account. However, even if you're transferring from a special needs trust into an ABLE account, it would still be subject to that $14,000 annual contribution cap. So that's important to note. Um, another transfer uh, question that we get a lot is whether or not you can transfer a 529 college savings um, account directly into a, a 529 ABLE account. And unfortunately, the answer to that right now is no. The only way to get funds from a college savings account, a 529 college savings account, into an ABLE account would be to make an, an unqualified disbursement from the college savings account, and the person would be subject to the, the applicable tax consequences and penalties, and then you could deposit um, whatever is left, provided that it doesn't go over that $14,000 limit, into the ABLE account. Um, that being said, we've gotten that question quite a bit, and there is a uh, piece of legislation that has been filed in Congress to allow for a clean rollover uh, from a 529 college savings account into an ABLE account, but even if that was to pass, it would still be subject to that $14,000 um, contribution limit. Uh, so that's important to note. Uh, let's see uh, some other questions here. Uh, are there any age restrictions for those who are eligible? So you can open an, uh, up an account, an ABLE account, at any age. Um, that doesn't matter whatsoever. The thing that relates to age is one of the characteristics that must be met in terms of eligibility is the person must have experienced or what's called having an onset of their disability before their 26th birthday. So as an example, um, my brother has intellectual and developmental disabilities, he lives down in Texas. He was born with a uh, significant disability, so clearly he experienced his disability before his 26th birthday. Now he's currently 35 years old. He just opened up his ABLE account um, at, I think, 34 years old, um, or 35. Um, now, he was older than 26, but he experienced his disability before his 26th birthday, so that was fine. So again, you have to experience your, your disability before your 26th birthday, but you, so long as that's met and the other requirements are met, you can open up an ABLE account at any age. Okay. So let's go back. Uh, we've answered a couple of those questions. I, I wanted to ask a few more of John, uh, uh, if you could. I know that we've gone over just the incredibly wide array of different expenses that can be uh, paid for with ABLE accounts. I'm curious, specific to your son James, uh, what are some of the things that you're hoping that contributions into, into James's uh, ABLE account could pay for related to his disability? So we have uh, two plans with the Mind the ABLE account, one short-term and a longer-term plan. Um, short-term, we see how we'll be using the money to supplement paying for his companion. Um, James um, does have the pleasure of um, some friends, paid companions, and we anticipate using the funds for especially his job coach, where if we find more work opportunities for him. We really don't want to lose the opportunity for him to work, so we'll be using money to hire someone, um, help him in the jobs, the second will be uh, long-term goal will be used to plan, pay for some of James, uh, James' living expenses. It's always been difficult because you can't really pay for uh, rent or utilities. In, they're considered in-kind supports, and they can jeopardize your SSI payment. So we anticipate paying some utilities and p potentially the rent um, from the money. There are some rules you have to follow when you're paying for the rent, but I think 
the exception of allowing those type of payments from the ABLE account were really a loud statement to me that they understand how rigid sometimes the SSI rules are when, when crafting the, the, the regulations for the ABLE accounts. Gotcha. Thank you, John. Uh, now, you talked a little bit about short and long-term expenses. I want to ask a question of Martha specific to the, uh, the attainable savings plan. Uh, Martha, are there any, uh, if an individual was uh, to enroll in the attainable savings plan and they were using the funds pretty frequently for short-term um, disability-related needs, are there any fees associated uh, with the number of withdrawals that an individual takes uh, if they need to make more frequent withdrawals as a result of having more frequent disability-related expenses? In the attainable program, there are not those additional fees. Um, so what we, you know, we, we are fortunate that there is a program that's provided by Fidelity um, where a, a, an individual could open up, but doesn't have to, open up um, a cash management account. And through that cash management account, it allows them to really manage their cash on a daily basis. But, you know, that's an opportunity to have a free checking, um, debit card, ATM withdrawals. Um, so that is available as it is to any Fidelity customer, but it's not a requirement of being part of the attainable program. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I know that's very important for a lot of folks who may uh, mm -hmm. need to access those funds more frequently. I'm glad to hear uh, that the attainable savings plan has those options, although like you said, if the person wants to, um, you know, perhaps isn't touching the funds as frequently, they don't necessarily have to put the money into that um, type of checking uh, money uh, market type of account if they don't want to. So it's good that they no, have not the, at all. the opportunity. Yeah, they have options. Okay. Excellent, yep. excellent. That's great. Um, going back to some of the questions that have been uh, submitted, uh, is there a way to get notified by email when a new ABLE program is established? Uh, in fact, there is. If you go to the ABLE National Resource Center website, um, and click on the, uh, there's a button on the, on the home page that will allow you to sign up for a listserv, and whenever there is a new program launched, we make sure to get an, a, uh, an ABLE alert out to everybody on that listserv to, to let them know that, you know, a specific state has launched their program. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook. We also do um, state ABLE launch announcements uh, through our um, Facebook page there and our Twitter. So those are uh, additional ways to keep up to um, keep up to date in terms of which programs have launched and which ones are in development. Also, you can always go to the front page of the website and there's a giant map of the United States uh, and you'll notice that the states, uh, as soon as they launch a program, we change the color of the state um, so that you can identify which uh, states have ABLE programs and which are in development. In addition to that, you can only, always click on the, uh, any given state and it will give you more information about uh, that particular state. Um, so with that, I think we are just about out of time. Um, thank you so much to John and to Martha for lending their time and expertise to our webinar today. This concludes uh, the fifth webinar of our hashtag Able to Save campaign. Again, uh, if uh, you'd like to review the materials uh, of this webinar or any of the webinars that we've had over the last month, you can go to our website. Uh, you will find the slides there. You will find accessible slides. Um, and within the next week or so, uh, we will be archiving uh, all the webinars will be up on the website so that you can take another look at those or if perhaps you missed one of the ones in the previous weeks, you can access them there. So uh, thank you again to our guest panelists and thank you to everybody who was able to attend the webinar today. Have Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Thank Great you. Job. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.